Hello, and welcome to Mayor Brown's webinar on the arm's length standard in a post-BEPS world. I'm Scott Stewart, a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office and a member of the tax controversy and transfer pricing practice. I represent taxpayers at all levels of federal tax controversy, including audits, administrative appeals before the Internal Revenue Service, mediation involving the appeals division of the IRS, and litigation before the United States Tax Court. Joining me today as co-presenters are partner Astrid Perone and Director of Transfer Pricing and Valuation Services, Elena Kripanova. Astrid leads the Mayor Brown European Transfer Pricing Center that coordinates transfer pricing strategies and controversies in Europe. Her practice covers counseling on the transactional aspects of transfer pricing, tax optimization of mergers and acquisitions, structuring of investment funds, and general assistance to private equity deals. Elena has 20 years of transfer pricing, valuation, and general quantitative analysis experience. She has performed transfer pricing and valuation analyses for purposes of advanced pricing agreements, tax planning, contemporaneous documentation, audit defense, and litigation for clients that range from some of the world's largest multinational enterprises to privately held companies in a wide range of industries. Before we begin, we'd like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. First, as, noticed, as noted under the FAQ widget on the right side of your screen, today's program is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presentation. With that said, let's get started. As stated, the title of today's webinar is The Arm's Length Standard in a Post-BEPS World. We will consider the ongoing viability of the Arm's Length Standard in light of the OECD's BEPS initiative. The Arm's Length Standard has been the bedrock of transfer pricing analysis for nearly as long as multinational corporations have been in existence. In a nutshell, the premise of the Arm's Length Standard is that related parties should price transactions between themselves in the same manner that unrelated parties price similar transactions. That sounds simple enough, but as with so many things, the devil is in the details. In fact, implementation and application of the arm's length standard has led to protracted disputes between taxpayers and tax authorities for decades. Many of these disputes involve allocation of income related to high-value intangibles. After a brief background discussion, we will focus on some recent developments with respect to the arm's length standard, including the concepts of aggregation, realistic alternatives, and value chain, each of which will be discussed in more detail. Let's start by briefly reviewing the foundation of the arm's length standard. The arm's length standard, also called arm's length principle, is defined in Article 9 of the OECD Model Tax Convention. It states that if conditions of transactions between the related enterprises differ from those which would be made between independent enterprises, then profits may be reallocated between the related enterprises and taxed accordingly. The OECD guidelines explain further that the arm's length principle treats the members of a multinational group as if they operated as separate entities rather than as inseparable parts of a single unified business, and that by treating the members of a multinational group as if they were independent entities, we focus on the nature of the transactions between those members and on whether the conditions in these transactions differ from the conditions that would be obtained in un incomparable transactions between uncontrolled parties. And so this is the essence of the arm's length standard. We perform what is called a comparability analysis of the party's functions, assets, and risks, and if these conditions are comparable in the controlled and uncontrolled settings, then the pricing in the controlled and uncontrolled transactions need to be comparable as well. The arm's length standard is over 80 years old. It dates back to the 1935 publication of Section 45-1B of the U.S. Corporate Income Tax Regulations, which defined the purpose of the standard to be the allocation of corporate income tax among related parties. The theoretical construct of the arm's length standard puts associated and independent enterprises on a more equal footing for tax purposes, 
and strives to prevent distortion to their relative competitive positions by leveling the playing field. The arm's length standard has been found to work effectively in the vast majority of cases. However, the standard has been subject to, to criticism of late. Some argue that this separate entity approach of the arm's length standard may not always account for the economies of scale and interrelation of diverse activities within an integrated business. Others point out that the standard is difficult to apply because associated enterprises may engage in transactions that independent enterprises would not undertake. And yet others claim that the arm's length standard is the cause of the problems because it cannot prevent artificial arrangements between related parties and therefore cannot function as an anti-avoidance measure. The BEPS actions attempted to address this criticism while at the same time defending the relevance of the standard. So let's review the developments in the analyses of functions, risks, and assets within the BEPS framework. In 2015, the OECD published BEPS actions 8 through 10 with a poignant title, Aligning Transfer Pricing Outcomes with Value Creation, which was subsequently incorporated in OECD Transfer Pricing Guidelines. Pre-BEPS, the arm's length standard was seen as being vulnerable to manipulation because of its perceived emphasis on contractual allocation of functions, assets, and risks, which in OECD's view caused a distortion between the location of taxable income and the value created through the underlying economic activity carried out by the members of a multinational enterprise. Therefore, one prominent change we see in BEPS actions is the focus on the concept of realistic alternatives and commercial rationality. The guidelines are careful to emphasize that the key question in the analysis is whether the actual transactions possesses the commercial rationality of arrangements that would be agreed between unrelated parties under comparable economic circumstances and not whether the same transaction can be observed between independent parties. Another prominent development is the focus on the, quote, perspective of each of the parties to the transaction. In OECD's view, a comparability analysis focusing only on one side of a transaction may not provide a sufficient basis for evaluating a transaction because tax authorities increasingly view transactions that take place within a multinational enterprise as being integrated parts of the group's business rather than its discrete components. For this reason, BEPS actions 8 through 10 and OECD guidelines emphasize the analysis of the value chain over the specific transactions between specific related parties and focus on how value is generated by the group as a whole on the interdependencies of the functions performed by the associated enterprises with the rest of the group and the contribution that the associated enterprises make to that value creation. Note that in 2017 guidelines, the factor of, quote, assets used and risks assumed was amended by focusing on, quote, how the functions performed by the parties relate to the wider generation of value by the multinational group to which the parties belong, the circumstances surrounding the transaction, and industry practices. Another important development is the emphasis on the performance of functions and exercise of control over contractual terms and ownership of assets. The revised risk analysis goes hand-in-hand hand with the increased emphasis on substance and functions and decreased reliance on contracts. The intent of the revised risk analysis is to address what the OECD views as instances of shifting risks and IP ownership to low tax jurisdictions with insufficient supporting substance and lack of control over risk. The guidelines focus on economically significant risks, that is, the risks with the biggest impact on the bottom line. The concept of control has been revised in Chapters 1 and 6. The revisions contemplate that in order for the contractual assumption of risk to be respected, the risk-assuming party will need to have a robust decision-making capability and to be able to exercise that capability. Control over risk is also necessary for the provider of funding to earn more than a risk-free return and for the owner of intangible to earn more than just a routine return when it outsources DMP functions. Note that the U.S. Treasury regs on risk in Section 482 have not changed. The U.S. regs generally respect the allocation of risks specified or implied by the taxpayer's contractual terms if it is consistent with the economic substance of the transaction, where the substance is evaluated on the basis of the controlled trans 
taxpayers' conduct, its financial capacity to fund losses, and the extent to which each controlled taxpayer exercises managerial or operational control. In other words, the control risk in, seems to be a much stronger requirement in the OECD guidelines than the U.S. Treasury regulations. As in other areas of the tax law, the concept of economic substance has a role to play in transfer pricing analysis. For decades, a basic principle underlying transfer pricing analysis has been that the commissioner will evaluate the results of a transaction as actually structured by the taxpayer with the proviso that the transaction as structured must reflect economic substance. Implicit but not stated is the notion that the commissioner may ignore the taxpayer structure if the transaction lacks economic substance. But lack of economic substance is a high bar for the commissioner to overcome unless the taxpayer's transaction is simply a sham, which is rarely the case. Generally then, the commissioner must evaluate that the taxpayer's transaction as structured. Assuming the taxpayer's structure has substance and is respected, an important second principle is that the commissioner may look to alternatives realistically available to the taxpayer in evaluating the prices charged or paid in the intercompany transaction. On its surface, this realistic alternatives principle seems relatively uncontroversial. In recent practice, though, the IRS's application of the realistic alternatives principle has, in fact, been quite controversial. As we will see in more detail when we get to a discussion of recently litigated cases, the commissioner has used the realistic alternatives principle to, in effect, disregard the taxpayer's transactions as structured without actually asserting that the taxpayer's transactions lack economic substance. So far, though, the courts have rejected this approach. The revised risk analysis is super important because it permeates all other analyses, including those of realistic alternatives, commercial rationality, and value chain. The revised risk analysis attempts to marry the fragmentation of risks and functions within a multinational enterprise with the integrated nature of its operation. In other words, within a multinational group in the past, what could happen was the functions could be performed by one set of entities, risks be borne by another, while financing of these operations could be performed by yet another related party. At the same time, control over these activities could be exercised by individual entities or it could be centralized at the multinational group's level. The goal of the revised risk analysis is to make sure the allocation, assumption, management, and control of risk among the members of the multinational group is consistent with the arm's length standard and is compensated accordingly. The revised risk analysis has six steps. Step one identifies with specificity the economically significant risks that have the biggest potential impact on anticipated profit or loss. Step two determines contractual assumption of risk. While contractual terms remain the starting point, however, they are no longer dispositive of, what, of determining which related party bears which risk. Step three performs functional analysis of risk by considering which enterprise performs control functions and risk mitigating functions, which enterprises bear the risk outcomes, which enterprises have the financial capacity to assume the risk. Step four interprets steps one and three by considering conduct, capacity, and control. In particular, when we determine whether the related party's conduct in relation to risk conforms to their contract. If not, conduct generally controls. We also consider control and capacity. Specifically, whether the related party assumes the risk, exercises the control over risk, and whether it has the financial capacity to assume the risk. In step five, allocation of risk is analyzed. Control and financial capacity are required for a contractual risk assumption to be respected. Finally, in step six, we get to price the transaction, taking into account the consequences of the risk allocation. Closely related to the question of fragmentation and integration of economic activities within a multinational enterprise is the issue of whether control transactions should be evaluated on a separate or combined basis. This language in the section on evaluation of a taxpayer's separate and combined transactions has not changed between the 2010 and 2017 OECD guidelines, but now that language echoes the aggregation principle in temporary regs 
482-1T, which state that the decision to aggregate is based on two criteria. One, the extent to which the transactions are economically interrelated, and two, the relative reliability of the measure of an arm's length result. The taxpayer must determine whether an aggregate analysis of all transactions leads to a more accurate result compared to a separate analysis of each transaction. The temporary regs cited above expired on September 14 of this year, but were accompanied by proposed regs which appear to remain outstanding. Also, Section 482 amendment in the tax reform appears to create bias toward aggregation at least with respect to intangibles when it says that the Treasury shall require the valuation of intangible property on an aggregate basis or on the basis of their realistic alternatives to such a transfer. The aggregation principle potentially casts a cloud over the application of the arm's length standard because it is not clear how an arm's length standard would have to be tested on an aggregate basis if separate comparable uncontrolled transactions are available, but the taxing authority decides that aggregation is the most reliable approach. At this point, the degree of the taxing authority's discretion to assert aggregation is unclear, as is the criteria for testing economic interrelatedness as a condition for aggregation. Increasing globalization of business led to the formation of the increasingly complex multinational supply chains and the fragmentation of functions and risks between the members of a multinational group, while also making the business more integrated and intracompany transactions more complex. The OECD guidelines define the value chain as the full range of activities that firms engage in to bring a product to market, from conception to final use. Such activities include design, production, marketing, logistics, distribution, and customer support, and may be performed by the same firm or shared among several firms. Characteristics of global value chains include vertical integration of economic activities, which at the same time are fragmented and dispersed across countries, are increasingly specialized in tasks and business functions, and rely on coordinated networks of buyers and suppliers. The goal of the BEP sections 8 through 10 with regard to an arm's length standard was to ensure the alignment of taxation and economic substance within the horizontal and vertical distribution of value created by the global value chains. The OECD envisions that taxpayers will demonstrate the alignment of income and economic substance through the revamped functional analysis of the value chain which will identify the commercial or financial relations in fragmented activities, determine whether these activities are highly interdependent, and if so, the nature of the interdependencies and how the commercial activity to which the associated enterprises contribute is coordinated. So once the guidelines advance the idea of integrated supply chains, what happened to the methods we use to price related party transactions into the arm's length standard. One of the biggest concerns in the transfer pricing community is that we may be nearing the end of one-sided methods and heading toward a wider application of profit splits because the extent of interrelatedness that would require the application of profit splits is rather subjective, potentially giving tax administrations carte blanche uh, to reject one-sided methods. The language in the revised Chapter 2 on profit split is quite telling. The guidelines suggest that once the profit split method is determined to be the most appropriate, it would not matter whether the method would or would not be used between independent enterprises. The method would still be used between related parties because the purpose of the method is not to replicate arm's length behavior, but rather to serve as a means of establishing and or verifying arm's length outcome for controlled transactions. So the big concern now is that the profit split may become a default method whether this is warranted or not. The guidelines say that the existence of unique and valuable contributions by each party to the control transactions is perhaps the clearest indicator that a transactional profit split may be appropriate, but other indicators also include a high level of integration in the business operations to which the transactions relate and or the shared assumption of economically significant risk by the parties to the transaction. 
Another concern from the revised Chapter 1 is non-recognition of the transaction. The guidance in Chapter 1 states that the transaction as accurately delineated may be disregarded and replaced by an alternative transaction if the arrangements made in relation to the transaction viewed in their totality differ from those which would have been adopted by independent enterprises behaving in a commercially rational manner in comparable circumstances. This language is very similar to the 2010 guidelines. But the next paragraph in the 2017 guidelines states that, quote, the mere fact that the transaction may not be seen between independent parties does not mean that it does not have characteristics of an arm's length arrangement. This is the same language as in 2017 guidelines in restructuring in Chapter 9 and 2010 guidelines. So what makes transfer pricing practitioners nervous? Even though the language regarding non-recognition did not change perceptibly, the 2017 guidelines appear to provide ammunition to tax administrations to more freely recharacterize the transaction if the taxpayer's commercial rationality does not match commercial rationality as understood by the tax administration. We are yet to see how this plays out since it has been only 18 months since the guidelines were published. I will now address the specific post-debt provision for intangibles. The 2010 OECD guidance determining arms-length condition for transactions that involve the use or transfer of intangibles has been replaced with a new guidance in the 2017 version. pre the, the definition of intangible was specific, and the 2010 guidance defined intangible by reference to patents, trademark, trade names, etc., as well as to know trade secrets of business rights. The new guidance offers a much broader definition. Indeed, in, according to the Chapter 6, the word intangible is intended to address something which is not a physical asset or a financial asset, which is capable of being owned or controlled for use in commercial activities and whose use or transfer would be compensated as it occurred in a transaction between independent parties in comparable circumstances. So you will note that there is neither accounting or legal definition are important for transfer pricing purposes. What actually matters is the determination of the condition that would agree upon between independent parties for a comparable transaction. I would like now to make a few remarks with respect to the allocation of income deriving from the exploitation of a specific intangible. According to the new guidelines, the focus is on the dumpy function. Each member of the group should receive arm's compensation for the functions it performs. The identification of the members of the group performing functions related to development, enhancement, maintenance, protection and exploitation, dumpy function, is one of the key considerations in determining arm's condition for control transaction. With respect to legal ownership, in order to be entitled to retain all the returns, and as uh, mentioned earlier in this presentation, the legal owner must perform all of the functions, contribute all assets used, and assume all risks related to dumpy. What does it mean that he needs to physically perform those functions for his own personal? All sourcing is uh, possible according to this chapter. So the, consequently, the importance of legal ownership is, is, is much reduced. The allocation of income derived from utili utilizing a specific intangible will depend on the actual economic function performed, the asset use, and risk assumed in the dumpy of intangible. The second question I would like to address is uh, who has a right on the profit or loss relating to differences between the actual ex post profitability and the proper estimation of anticipated profitability, the ex ante profitability. According to Chapter 6, Revised Chapter 6, that will depend on which entity or entities in the group which in fact assume the risk as identified when delineating the actual transaction. It will also depend on the entity or entities which are the performing the most important function, 
or contributing to the control over the economically significant risk and for which it is determined that an arm's length remuneration of this function would include a profit sharing element. The hard-to-value intangibles is a new concept in the 2017 guidelines. HTVI are intangibles for which, at the time of their transfer between associated enterprises, no reliable comparables exist and the projections of future cash flows or income expected from the transferred intangibles or the assumptions used in valuing these intangibles are highly uncertain. In cases where HTVI is asserted by the tax administration, the idea is that ex post outcomes would be able to provide presumptive evidence about the arm's length nature of the ex ante pricing arrangement if the differences are not due to unforeseen events and they are subject to rebuttal by taxpayers. The use of exposed evidence is inappropriate in certain circumstances, including when at least one of the following exceptions applies. The taxpayer provides details of ex ante projections or reliable evidence of unforeseeable developments or the probability of certain foreseeable outcomes. The transfer of the HTVI is covered by a bilateral or multilateral APA. The difference between financial projections and actual outcomes does not change the compensation for the HTVI by more than plus or minus 20%. And during the five-year commercialization period, the difference between financial projections and actual outcomes was not greater than 20%. The burden of proof that the transaction is not HTVI is on the taxpayer. In order to avoid the HTVI label, the taxpayer is expected to show that the cuts and cups it uses are reliable and the projections and assumptions, even if uncertain, appropriately consider the likelihood of the outcomes. This seems to be a steep mountain to climb. It can be very difficult to distinguish ex post evidence from hindsight, the cuts and cups that were perfectly arm's length ex ante, given the likelihood of the outcomes, may appear to be not arm's length ex post. The ex ante unforeseeable events may appear foreseeable ex post, and may fail to satisfy the arm's length standard in the eyes of tax authorities. Once HTVI has been asserted, tax administrations can make adjustments to the reported amounts or make adjustments to reflect an alternative pricing structure that is different from the structure adopted by the taxpayer. This resonates with Section 482-1F, which states that the commissioner may adjust the consideration charged in the control transaction based on the cost or profit of the alternative, but will not restructure the transaction as if the alternative had been adopted by the taxpayer. So what can taxpayers do to avoid the HTVI label? The most important element is we need to do our homework on the subject ex intangible ex ante, which would include collecting and retaining financial forecasts understanding and documenting industry practices, collecting cuts and cups, and then be flexible in the commercial arrangements we put in place by perhaps adopting shorter-term arrangements, including price adjustment clauses, contingent payment structures, and having the ability to re renegotiate. The flexibility of the arrangement can prove to be more beneficial than having to fight with exam on whether the use of ex post results constitute hindsight. The 2017 OECD revised guidelines left a series of questions open, and in particular, the guidance for determining whether the condition of certain financial transactions between associate enterprise are consistent with the arm's length principle. The draft guidance on financial transactions has been published in last July for public consultation purposes. The draft proposed some controversial approaches, and whatever form the final gu guidance takes, it is clear that all businesses with related party financial transactions will need to review how they price them, that the agreements are properly worded, that both parties are able to perform their roles in the transaction, and that they actually do so in practice. Indeed, the first part of the discussion draft provides guidance on the situation 
in which loans can be recharacterized as debt. According to the draft guidance, one should first identify what should be treated as a debt for tax purpose. And debt should be treated as equity if the borrower cannot service the full amount of the debt. Another point is the verification of respectively the lender and the borrower function to see if they actually perform those functions. The second part of the guidance provides provide uh, information of uh, advice on the pricing of financial transactions such as treasury services, loans, cash pooling, hedging, financial guarantees, and captive insurance. It is noted that appropriate interest rates, according to this draft, can be identified from similar recent loans to similar borrowers. The guidance also refers to the possibility of building up an interest rate by adding a risk-appropriate profit margin to the lender's cost of funds. One of the controversial proposals is that the credit rating of any subsidiary can be assumed to be the same as that of the parent company of the group as a whole. Another controversial proposal is that the average interest rate paid by a group on its external debt could be used as the rate for all loans within the group. The public consultation ended up on September 7 and received numerous comments. In Europe, we have seen recent development in connection with the Armstrong principle. I will now focus on three specific topics. The CCTB proposal, the use of comparables in Europe, and finally, the EU stated case using the arms length standard as a test. First, the proposition to introduce a common consolidated corporate tax base in Europe. This proposal is, has been made by the European Commission back to 2011 and has often been presented as the end of transfer pricing in Europe. What is the CCTB? In substance, it is a single set of rules that would allow companies operating within the European Union to calculate their taxable profit on a uniform basis and for the aggregate profit to be apportioned between member states on an agreed basis. The key allocation could be assets, labor, and recently introduced digital presence. That initial proposal was optional and was presented as a reduction of administrative burden for the multinational enterprise, and also included an automatic consolidation across border loss relief. Lacking proposal, it has been left aside for a while and revisited in March 2015 with a different focus. As a part of the action plan for a fair and efficient corporate tax system in the European Union. Spin relaunched it in, in uh, October 2016 as a two-step process. The first step was the common base, and later on, the consolidation would have been adopted. So if adopted, the CCTB would be mandatory and would apply to all group of companies with a total annual turnover in excess of 750 million and conducting business activities in the internal market through a taxable presence in a European member state. This draft directive requires unanimity for becoming life. Until now, there is clearly a lack of consensus amongst the member states, even if it should be noted that France and Germany agreed on a common position paper in June of this year. The use of comparable in Europe is source of litigation. Indeed, in some member states, establishing the lack of local independent comparable data is a prerequisite for using pan-European database. In attempt to reduce litigation, the Joint Transfer Pricing Forum, the GTPF, which is the expert group at level of the European Commission, made recommendations to act in case of lack of local independent comparable. In, in fact, defining a relevant geographic market, looking at similarities in labor cost structure or GDP per capita, and that can be done on a case-by-case -case basis. 
According to the recommendation of the GTPF, conducting a pan-European comparable search in accordance with the OECD guidelines requires to refer to the relevant geographic market, which generally includes the territory in which the m and &E operates as long as it is homogeneous. Second, to document the reason underlying the choice of the region on which its comparable search is based, including the extent to which it considers that economic circumstances matter for the comparable search. That means that it is clearly a part of the transfer pricing documentation and should be in the local file. A new unexpected use of the arms length principle is the use made by the European Union Commission for state aid control purposes. We all know the Starbucks and Apple cases. State aid consists of any form of financial advantage comprising state resources with which selectively advantage an undertaking or group of undertakings. A financial advantage includes a derogation waiver of other modification of a tax regime which leads to a company paying less tax than would be due in the normal course. The Court of Justice of the European Union has confirmed that if the method of, ta of taxation for intra-group transfer does not comply with a market-based arms length principle and as a result leads to a lower taxable basis, then it provides a selective advantage to the company concerned. The question then is, is, is it the same arms length standard as the one we use in transfer pricing purposes? When used by the European Union Commission for State Aid Control Purposes, it is aimed at protecting a level playing field for all economic operators in the internal market, meaning protecting free competition, rather than protecting a tax base or preventing double taxation. In that function, this is part of competition law, not of tax law, and it may therefore deviate from the traditional OECD understanding of the principle. The case law on which the Commission relies is not very explicit, and it remains to be seen whether the European Court will endorse the Commission approach. What is clear is that the Commission is of the opinion that the company cannot have stateless income. Disagreements about interpreting and applying the arm's length standard have led to significant disputes between taxpayers and the Commissioner in recent years. In particular, taxpayers and the IRS Commissioner frequently disagree over whether specific transactional comparables, as reflected in the cut method of the transfer pricing regulations, or broad-based economic proof, as reflected in the comparable profits method of the regulations, best reflect the arm's length standard. As we will see, while taxpayers often resort to the comparable profits method for purposes of transfer pricing documentation due to ease of application, when it comes to litigation, the courts seem to prefer specific comparables as reflected in the cut method. Several prominent tax cases at various stages of litigation reflect disputes over application of the arm's length standard in general and comparability issues in particular. As we will see in more detail, disputes between taxpayers and the commissioner involve questions such as which party is the most appropriate tested party for transfer pricing purposes, whether specific comparable transactions or broader economic approaches best reflect arm's length principles, whether aggregation of transactions reaches an arm's length result in a particular case, and whether the commissioner can resort to a so-called realistic alternative in evaluating the taxpayer's intercompany transactions. The primary issue in Amazon involved a cost-sharing buy-in payment to be made in connection with the startup of Amazon's operations outside the United States, particularly in Europe. The commissioner and Amazon agreed that Amazon Luxembourg needed to make a buy-in payment to compensate Amazon US for intangible property, particularly computer software, made available to Amazon Luxembourg. The parties disagreed vehemently, however, over the appropriate amount of the buy-in payment. The taxpayer valued the buy-in payment by looking to amounts paid by Amazon's customers, particularly certain major retailers such as Target Corporation, for access to Amazon's website technology. In other words, the taxpayer relied on specific comparable transactions to determine the appropriate amount of the buy-in payment.
The commissioner, on the other hand, determined the amount of the buy-in payment using a discounted cash flow or income method that determined the present value of the entire profit of Amazon's operations outside the United States in perpetuity. In other words, the commissioner relied on broad economic principles rather than specific comparable transactions to determine the amount of the buy-in payment. In particular, the commissioner relied on two closely related arguments. First, the commissioner asserted that it is appropriate to aggregate all of the transactions related to Amazon's European business in order to determine the amount of the buy-in payment. Second, and closely related to the commissioner's first argument, the commissioner asserted that one realistic alternative available to Amazon US was to enter into the European business on its own without assistance from Amazon Luxembourg. Combining these two positions, the commissioner determined the future value of the European business by determining the present value of the profits of that business in perpetuity. According to the commissioner, that present value is the appropriate amount of the buy-in payment. A trial was held in the fall of 2015. Using the cut method based on Amazon's own third-party transactions, Amazon's experts valued the intangibles covered by the buy-in at between $284 million and $413 million. The commissioner, using its discounted cash flow income method, valued the buy-in payment at $3.5 billion. The court held that the commissioner's discounted cash flow income method was flawed and adopted the taxpayer's cut method with certain modifications. In addressing the commissioner's discounted cash flow method, the court found that the method was flawed for several reasons. Among these reasons, the court found that Amazon's intangibles had relatively short useful lives and would not have value in perpetuity as asserted under the commissioner's discounted cash flow method. In addition, the court found that the commissioner's discounted cash flow method effectively charged Amazon Luxembourg twice for cost-shared intangibles once as part of the asserted buy-in payment, and again as ongoing payments to be made under the cost-sharing agreement. For these reasons, the court rejected the commissioner's position. The IRS has appealed the tax court's opinion in Amazon. In support of its aggregation theory, the IRS asserts on appeal that all business intangibles, including goodwill and going concern value, are compensable under the buy-in transaction. Interestingly, both parties point to an expansion of the definition of intangibles under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act as support for their respective positions. For its part, the IRS asserts that the expanded definition of intangibles is simply a clarification and reflects longstanding law regarding the breadth of the intangibles subject to the buy-in payment. To counter the court's determination regarding double counting of the value of intangibles developed in the future, the commissioner points out that he subtracted the value of expected future cost-sharing payments in determining the value of the buy-in payment, an argument previously rejected by the tax court. Regarding the expansion of the definition of intangibles under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the taxpayer asserts that the change under the TCJA was a substantive one, and therefore the scope of the intangibles subject to the buy-in during the years at issue is narrower than what the commissioner asserts. Amazon asserts that, as in Veritas, the commissioner's discounted cash flow approach is a thinly veiled attempt to use later additions to the statute to bolster its position in litigation involving earlier years. In support of its position, the taxpayer points to legislative history which states that the new law should not be construed to create any inference with respect to the application of Section 936H3 before 2018. The Ninth Circuit's opinion in Amazon may determine whether the commissioner's discounted cash flow income method has any continuing viability in transfer pricing disputes. The next case we'll look at is Medtronic versus the Commissioner. Somewhat similar to Amazon, the key dispute in Medtronic is whether Medtronic's operations in Puerto Rico made arm's length payments to the U.S. parent for use of Medtronic's intangible assets at its manufacturing facilities in Puerto Rico. Unlike Amazon, however, Medtronic does not involve a cost sharing arrangement. Therefore, the key issue in Medtronic is the amount of the ongoing royalty to be paid by Puerto Rico 
for use of manufacturing intangibles and not the appropriate amount of a cost-sharing buy-in payment. Questions in Medtronic that implicate the arm's length standard include which party, Puerto Rico or the U.S., is properly viewed as the tested party in determining the appropriate level of the royalty? Whether a cut method or a CPM is the best, me is the best method to use to determine the amount of the royalty? Whether it is appropriate to aggregate transactions in order to determine the proper level of the ro royalty? And whether, as a realistic alternative, Medtronic U.S. could simply replace Medtronic Puerto Rico as a manufacturer of devices and earn the entire income from the transactions itself. The tax court's opinion in Medtronic largely adopted Medtronic's position. Reminiscent of the commissioner's contract manufacturer position in earlier transfer pricing cases, the commissioner's comparable profits method treated Medtronic Puerto Rico as a routine manufacturer without specialized skills. After allowing for a routine return to Medtronic Puerto Rico based on a return on assets profit level indicator, the commissioner reallocated all additional profits to the United States as an imputed royalty for the intangibles used by Puerto Rico. In response, Medtronic asserted that Medtronic Puerto Rico was much more than a contract manufacturer, pointing in particular to the important quality control functions performed by Puerto Rico. The IRS argued that quality was merely a baseline competency and other manufacturers could meet the same quality standards. The tax court held that the commissioner's CPM analysis was flawed for several reasons. The court found that product quality was of paramount importance to the medical device industry. Since Medtronic Puerto Rico was responsible for ensuring a level of, re of reliability well beyond that of an ordinary manufacturer, it was entitled to more than a routine manufacturing return. The comparables used by the commissioner did not appropriately take into account Puerto Rico's important role. Similarly, rejecting the IRS's realistic alternatives position, the court held that Medtronic Puerto Rico was not replaceable for similar reasons. Recognizing that the commissioner's comparable profits method was essentially an aggregation method, the court rejected the commissioner's position on this basis as well. While the regulations permit aggregation of transactions under appropriate circumstances, aggregation was not appropriate here due to the important role of Puerto Rico in ensuring product quality. For this reason, profits allocated to Puerto Rico under the comparable profits method were unreasonably small. Medtronic relied on a royalty derived from a comparable transaction involving a cross-license with Pacesetter. The Pacesetter agreement involved some of the same intangible property licensed to Puerto Rico. While the Pacesetter agreement was not a perfect comparable, the court found that appropriate adjustments could be made to the Pacesetter comparable, and therefore the compar comparable uncontrolled transactions method was the best method to use to determine an arm's length royalty. The royalties derived using the pace that are comparable were similar to the royalties determined under a memorandum of understanding previously entered into between the commissioner and Medtronic. The commissioner appealed the tax court's opinion to the Eighth Circuit. On appeal, the commissioner primarily attacks the court's use of the pace setter agreement as a comparable on several grounds. First, the agreement was used to settle litigation. Second, the agreement was a cross-license. Third, the profit potential of the intangibles involved in the pace setter agreement may have been different from that of the property license to Puerto Rico. And fourth, the royalty under the pace setter agreement included a lump sum payment. In essence, the commissioner asserts that appropriate adjustments cannot be made to the pace setter agreement to address each of these issues, and therefore the comparable uncontrolled transaction method using the pace setter agreement is not the best method to determine the royalty. The Eighth Circuit remanded the case to the tax court for further consideration of these issues, and that opinion is pending. What are the implications of Medtronic for transfer pricing audits? The tax court's opinion in Medtronic appears to st express a strong preference for the transactional proof in the form of cuts over a CPM analysis. However, the CPM is almost always easier to apply than the cut method. Therefore, most taxpayers use the CPM as the best method in their transfer pricing documentation and develop further transactional proof if and when litigation is on the horizon. <laughs> 
The next case we'll look at is Coca-Cola versus the commissioner. The Internal Revenue Service in Coca-Cola asserts transfer pricing adjustments of about $9 billion from Coke's foreign affiliates to the U.S. parent based on an assertion that Coke's foreign affiliates were overcompensated for activities they performed. Similar to its position in Amazon, the IRS asserts that a realistic alternative available to the parent would be to terminate its relationships with the foreign affiliates and build a new foreign network at lower cost than the current relationship. But the IRS does not appear to assert that the current relationship lacks economic substance, which, according to the taxpayer, bars the realistic alternative analysis proposed by the commissioner. The parties disagree on some basic factual questions. First, the parties disagree on the basic factual question of whether the foreign affiliates had the capability to develop, manage, and exploit Coke's intangibles in the foreign markets. The taxpayer asserts that only the local affiliate was capable of developing and, exploiting the, developing and exploiting the intangibles in the local market, while the Internal Revenue Service asserts that this responsibility was borne by the parent. The parties also disagree on the factual question of who bore the cost of expenditures necessary to develop and maintain the intangibles in the foreign markets. These factual disagreements lead to legal disputes as well. Similar to the dispute in the DHL case of several years ago, for example, assuming the foreign entities bore the marketing costs, the parties disagree on whether the foreign entities are entitled to the economic return on the intangibles or those returns belong to the parent, which held legal title to most of the intangibles. The parties also disagree on the best method to use to evaluate the transactions. The taxpayer asserts that its related party transaction should be evaluated under a comparable and controlled transaction method using third-party franchising arrangements of companies such as McDonald's as cuts. Under this analysis, the foreign affiliates are entitled to the return of a master franchisor. This result is a split of the intangibles profits between the foreign affiliates and the parent. The IRS asserts that the best method is a CPM using the return on assets of independent Coke bottlers to determine the appropriate profit levels as, according to the IRS, the functions of the foreign affiliates are similar to those of independent bottlers. The result is an allocation of most or all of the intangible profit to the parent. Assuming for the sake of discussion that the CPM is an appropriate method, the parties also disagree on the appropriate profit level indicator under the CPM. The taxpayer asserts that the return on assets is not an appropriate PLI, since independent bottlers have a large stock of tangible assets, while the foreign affiliates of Coke do not. The taxpayer asserts that if the CPM were to apply, the foreign affiliates must earn an appropriate return on their costs incurred, not just hard assets, and a substantial comparability adjustment is necessary. The next case we'll look at is Eaton Corporation versus the Commissioner. Eaton and the Internal Revenue Service entered into two advanced pricing agreements covering the years 2001 through 2010. The APAs covered manufacturing of circuit breaker and electrical control products in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. In setting its transfer price, Eaton used a modified comparable uncontrolled price or cut method that guaranteed Eaton U.S. a certain return on distribution activities based on a return on distribution costs. The first APA also included a technology royalty using a cut. In essence, under this methodology, Eaton Puerto Rico earned the residual income. On audit for 2005 and 2006, the Internal Revenue Service took the extreme measures of canceling Eaton's APAs and adjusting Eaton's income. The IRS claimed that Eaton omitted or misrepresented material facts in negotiating the APAs and failed to comply with the terms and conditions of the APAs. Therefore, according to the IRS, it was justified in canceling the APAs. Apart from the cancellation of the APAs, the parties also disagreed over which entity was the appropriate tested party to determine an arm's length royalty. Similar to the IRS's position in Medtronic, the commissioner asserted that Eaton Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic were in essence contract manufacturers. Accordingly, after allowing for a routine return for manufacturing based on a return on assets analysis, the IRS asserted that the remaining profit should be allocated to the United States 
as compensation for intangibles used by Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. In addressing the threshold issue in the case, the tax court held that the IRS abused its discretion by canceling the APA for several reasons. First, the court noted that Eaton advocated for the cut method using the United States as a tested party throughout the APA negotiations. If the IRS did not agree with either the taxpayer's choice of tested party or the taxpayer's choice of the transfer pricing method, the commissioner could simply have refused to complete the APA. Further, the court found that Eaton's errors in connection with the APAs were immaterial and inadvertent and not sufficient to cancel the APAs. Because the tax court held that the commissioner was not justified in canceling the APAs, the court never reached the commissioner's secondary position regarding the allocation of income. The next case we'll look at is Facebook versus commissioner. On September 15, 2010, Facebook entered into a cost-sharing agreement with its Irish affiliate. Pursuant to a platform contribution transaction, Facebook granted to Facebook Ireland a license to use Facebook's intangible property, including software, outside the United States. Facebook concluded that the net present value of the platform contribution transaction property was $1.7 billion as of September 15, 2010. Facebook also transferred to Facebook Ireland user base and marketing intangibles, which Facebook valued at $4 billion. The IRS, on the other hand, determined that the net present value of the PCT property and marketing intangibles was $13.9 billion, an increase of $8.2 billion over the taxpayer's valuation. Facebook's petition states that the notice of deficiency doesn't explain the methodology used by the IRS to arrive at its determination of the net present value of the transfer property. Given the magnitude of the, adjustment, of the adjustment, though, it seems reasonable to assume that, like in Amazon, the IRS arrived at its valuation by attempting to determine the net present value of the foreign business in perpetuity. If so, the IRS's adjustment implicates its position on both aggregation and reasonable alternatives. With respect to reasonable alternatives, the IRS appears to believe that Facebook's reasonable alternative was to operate the foreign business entirely on its own and earn all the income associated with the foreign business in the United States in perpetuity. The IRS does not appear to assert, though, that Facebook's arrangements with Facebook Ireland lacks economic substance, a necessary predicate for a wholesale restructuring of the transaction. With respect to aggregation, the IRS appears to assert that the value of the platform contribution transaction and intangible license should reflect the value of all assets necessary to Facebook's operations outside the United States, regardless of what assets Facebook Ireland might already own or is expected to, to develop on its own in the future. A trial is scheduled for August of 2019. While we understand that the intent of the BEPS actions 8 through 10 was to improve the functioning of the arm's length standard, several concerns remain. First, the focus of the analysis on fragmented yet integrated activities may prompt some tax administrations to pursue profit splits as the preferred method. That and the reliance on HTVI can make it easier for tax authorities to recharacterize transactions and to use hindsight inconsistent with the arm's length standard. The revised risk analysis can allow tax administrations to disregard contractual allocation of risk, even if priced at arm's length. The analysis of realistic alternatives seems to allow the tax administrations to second-guess taxpayers' business decisions. And then CBCR requirement of Action 13 raises the specter of formula reapportionment. These are just some of the factors that continue to test the viability of the arm's length standard. In sum, the arm's length standard is sound in theory since it closely approximates the workings of the open market in cases where goods, services, or intangibles are transferred between related entities. Moreover, both taxpayers and tax authorities have developed a large body of experience implementing and evaluating the arm's length standard which has resulted, for the most part, in common understanding between taxpayers and tax authorities. 
Formulary apportionment, the only serious competitor to the arm's length standard, has serious problems of its own and at least for the foreseeable future has been rejected as the basis for allocating income among national jurisdictions. The U.S. Internal Revenue Service and other national tax authorities have expressed their commitment to the arm's length standard and the OECD has expressed its commitment as well. Therefore, although it is likely that disputes over implementation of the arm's length standard will, con will continue to arise in particular instances, the arm's length standard seems destined to remain the bedrock principle of transfer pricing for the foreseeable future. This concludes our webinar on the arm's length standard in a post-BEPS world. Thank you for joining us today. We hope the information we shared was useful. Thank you much for your participation and have a good day.